to the Guthrie America podcast. We sit down with amazing people who are doing life in our community and who are from here because we believe every story should be told. I'm your host, Hetty Coleman. Today, I'm sitting down with uh, Richard Dreesen. Before we jump into this conversation with Richard, would you please go ahead and subscribe to the podcast and leave a review? It would mean the world to me. Mr. Dreesen, how are you doing today? Yes, you're real fine. Thank you. I am so grateful to have you sitting across from me so I can ask you all sorts of questions. <laughs> it's a real honor to be here, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, and I don't know why I'm always interested in how people met their wives and or their spouses. How did you meet your wife? Well, we, she was in high school. She was one grade behind me in high school. We both attended Guthrie High School. Okay. And so... And we dated once in high school, and then she went away to nursing school, and I went back to the farm, went out to the farm, and three years later we got together because she was a good friend of my sister-in-law, and we were having supper one day, and she came over, and so we started up again, (laughs) and started dating then, and it wasn't very long until we got married. Do you remember how you asked her? Well, we just kind of decided, <laughs> we decided together. Most, most of our decisions were made by, together. <laughs> so it's just kind of a deal that y'all just made together. We're going to do this. and Yeah. Y- yeah. Uh, I, I, right after that, I went into the Navy for two years, and she was still in nurses training, and she had a year to go, but we still got married. Yeah. Why, I'm not sure. <laughs> It's, it's probably money. We got more, more money being married than I did single. So. Yes. Uh, what did uh, joining? Thank you for serving. Uh, what did the Navy take you? Like, what were some of the places that you remember? Well, I uh, after Bill out boot camp, went to it on an aircraft carrier, USS uh, Riskany, and spent one year on it. And then they transferred me. They took it out. They put it. In, Put it in dry dock to go to revamp it, and I sent them the last year out on a cargo ship and made two trips to the Far East. Oh, okay. Friends, Colum, Colum, Philippines, those places. Now, did you did you uh, did you not have any plans of staying very long? And you did no, your two years, and you, you know, were just, good. Just was going to go. I said I was a twenty year man, two in and eighteen out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's not my career. <laughs> that's good. That's good. So you you uh you get married, you go to the navy a couple of years, and then you come home to do and do what? Well, I came home. Say when I got out of high school, I farmed for three years with my father, and then then I went to the navy for two years, and then came back, and then I started a college five years after I graduated from high school. Oh, okay. And then I got my degree from. Central State, or Central Oklahoma now, but, uh, and then start teaching in Guthrie. Now, why math? Like, did you, did you have a love for math when you were younger? Well, um, I, I enjoyed math. I enjoyed my math classes. I wasn't particularly real sharp. I just, I made math is a pretty good subject. And, and I started out in Central State because I was farming out south of town, out mm-hmm. by Seward. And it was handy to go to Central State than it was to OSU. I thought when I started college, I was going to be an ag teacher like my brother was. Okay. But then I decided that I could stay on the farm and get my math degree, and I could teach math and still farm on the side. And I never did stop farming, always farmed some, and then start teaching math and, and got through. And then we taught here, taught here three years, and then we decided to we'd go overseas, felt the Lord leading us to do some mission work overseas. So we went over to Kenya and spent seven years in Kenya. And I taught math and science over there in a school. And so came back and went back into the Guthrie system and spent 15 more years in there. Or really, actually 12 years back in the system and then became principal and and finished up then. Took a year off and was going to do something else, and then I decided I wanted to teach rather than, to, and I went. I ended up going to Langston then for fifteen years. Uh huh. What? Uh, what? Because you made that transition from the classroom to being a principal, right? 
Correct. That is correct. What would for you? What was that like? Like, what what were the major differences for you? Well, um, you know, in the classroom, you just got that group that just one that you're with in your room, but in, when you press play, you're in the whole school. Yeah. And so I was able to, you know, take over when I first became principal. I was principal at Oak Faber. At the seventh grade, we just had a seventh grade class over Faber, and then I went to junior high. And Mr. Bradshaw had been there for 33 years, and he was retiring, so I moved from seventh grade principal to junior high principal and continued there 10 years in Guthrie. Okay. And then decided I wanted to do something else, so I tried something else for a year, tried real estate, and didn't like that, so I and found out that uh, a friend of mine, uh, Joy Flash, she taught out in Langston. She said, well, our math teacher died this summer. And so I says, well, I went out there and I applied and then got hired. So I continued out there then for 15 years. Was there a, a major difference in the way that you taught math in college versus when you were doing it in uh, secondary? Well, not really. I taught... Well, I taught a lot of the beginning courses in math out there and a lot of remedial courses. And so it was a lot of the same material. Yeah. yeah. I had taught, you know, for 20 years. So I, when I went out there, and so I just continued to teach and I enjoyed teaching. Uh, that was sure a good place to teach. Yeah. I enjoyed teaching out there. Being at Langston University. Now, tell me about Seward. Whenever you were younger, was Seward like a... A thriving little town because my grandfather lived out there and there was a school, a church, and all these things. Well, that's, that was it. A school, church, and, a, <laughs> and it had a post office. Had a post office. Oh, did it. they have a post office? That's right. Was it near the school? Yeah. Well, yeah. it was down there. Well, actually, it served in the mountains about four blocks of <laughs> houses anyway. And uh, there was a grocery store and a post office. And then there was a church and a school there. And that was all, <clears throat> that was Langston. I mean, that was Seward. Yeah. And then uh, the only thing that's left out of Seward now, they've got the Baptist church out there, but yeah. it wasn't. They took over the lot that used to be the, the uh, schoolhouse. And so that's all that's there in, in Seward anymore, the post office. They did away with it and brought it into Guthrie. and. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Hamm was the postmistress out there for years, and they lived there at the edge of town. A town. Yeah, yeah. Of, <laughs> uh, Oops, sorry, I keep going. Was the, was the post office at that time just for everything that was kind of like southwest from here? Because it, it still had the post office in town, post too. Office that had a written, and in other words, mail came to that post office directly. It didn't come through Guthrie. It came directly to the post yeah. office out there. And finally, they did away with that post office and brought it in Guthrie. Gotcha. And we became a, we were on a, on Seward route, and then we became a Guthrie route. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it was so small, it's just amazing that they had a post office out there. Well, they did. They did have, and they had post office there until they just tried to get it away with all the country the post office. Oh, uh, okay. That's, so at the time, there was country post offices everywhere. Yeah, well, there was one here, and then there was one out in Meridian, and, and you know, never post office around. Yeah. And so people didn't travel in, and post office was a need to move out uh, where the people were. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes, yeah, yes. We lived about a mile and a half west of Surrey. And that's where I grew up. Now, did you know my grandfather then? I didn't know your grandfather. Okay, then. okay. No. Uh-huh. And actually, there was quite a few black folks in town, nearly all the Seward, except for the postmistress and the one grocery store, McMillan grocery store out yeah. there. And the rest of the houses usually were kids, black folks. Yeah. Those. Yeah, that's what it. That's what it felt like when I was growing up, and when I would go out there, it seemed yeah. like it was more of a, a, a black town, a community. So yeah, it, it was more of a more like Langston. I mean, it was just yeah. it was established more of a black town. Yeah, and those two two businesses were in town. And that's all that was there. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And they had a church 
in town and, and a school. Yeah. So I didn't go to school there. I went to the mine, which is a little town out west of Seward. It's about about five miles west of Seward. It's not five like, miles west of Seward. So so do you take uh, Seward Road? Yeah, and go right on. It's about halfway between Seward and Cashin. Okay. And is it still there? No. Oh. <laughs> the town is not there. But it, it has high school. fact of the matter is, I had a brother and two sisters graduated from from Nevada High School. Wow. And uh, they had quite a little, little community there in Nevada, but there's nothing there but just a few people live in their houses now. Wow. But it had a high school and everything. They had a high school area. Yeah. Huh. In fact, the matter is, my sister was in the last class that graduated out there. Okay. I had never heard of that in my life until uh, Lemoyne sent me that uh, bio of you, and I was like, I've never heard of that place never before. Heard of it. I, I don't, well, I mean, nobody knows. There's no town, there's nothing there. So, what, what year was it that it stopped? Exi uh, the high school was no longer there. Well, then the high school was no longer there. It must have been about 35, okay. 1935 or 36, because uh, it was still, uh, my brother graduated from college in 39, and so he was the last class that graduated from the Biden High School. I mean, his, he, there were two classes that graduated from the Biden High School after that. Okay, okay. And uh, so it's, and it, it just disappeared. <laughs> I had a cousin that went down through the eighth grade. Uh -huh. it, it quit high school, and, but it still had an eighth grade up until, oh, it was probably in about 45. They okay. did away with the school altogether. Yeah. So. Did Langston ever have a high school? Yeah, Langston had a high school too. Okay. Because I remember they were up until eighth grade for just a little while. Like yeah, they didn't right. have the high school they anymore. They came to Coil and yeah, they were they had Langston High School. Huh. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, and that that makes sense though. Probably during those times, the travel was not as easy, and so people weren't traveling like they were now. No, no. And so they coming to the big, the larger towns for school was not as easy, I guess. And I came to guess it. We still lived out west of town, but we started, they had a bus route that I came to town the first, second grade, I came into Guthrie schools. Okay. Even though they, even though they had the Vine School, I transferred into Guthrie for some reason. I don't know. I still don't know why, but uh -huh. then I did and continued in Guthrie School then all through school. And came back and did my student teaching here and then came back and taught here and then came back and was crystal here. So <laughs> we well ingrained in Guthrie. It was all meant to be. It was yeah. all meant to be. What was it like? So your brother ends up teaching in Guthrie as well, right? Yes, he graduated from OSU and and graduated as an ag teacher and came to Guthrie in 1941 and started teaching in Guthrie. That was his second job he had was Guthrie. He taught out here until 52 he went to, or 51 he went to Stillwater then to the State Department vocation. Oh, okay. But he was the ag teacher here at Guthrie at the time. See the FFA the, at that time they didn't allow the girls in, they just boys. And the girls didn't come in until quite a bit later. Oh, okay. In fact the matter is my daughter was in, in FFA, and she's the first girl president in the state. For, uh, she was one of the president. She was a reporter for. She was the first state officer of the vocational agriculture program in uh, in Oklahoma. Oh wow! Man, so that's uh, because they just had to, at that time started let the girls come into the program. Uh huh. What? Uh, how, how how did your family get into farm? Was this your your father? My father was a farmer. And uh, my grandfather and had a place out <coughs> the farm we had out west of Seward. They got it in 1897, so he got it right after the run, or right after they got a petition or got a, 
uh, tied into the place. So it was in the family for over a hundred years. That farm was. Oh. We we've sold it now, it, but uh, it was in the Greeson family for over a hundred years. Oh wow, that's amazing! <laughs> <laughs> so. Over a hundred years, and so and then you and your brothers, they you all just kind of gravitated to that and kind of have just always been farmers. Well, we uh, yeah, continuing, and I figured that's what I was going to do the rest of my life was farm, and then after. Two or three years, I, my brother and I were both farming on a farm. He had been in the Air Force, and he got out of Air Force, and so he took over the farm, and I went to the Navy, and when I got out, we both farmed for a while, and then finally both of those got different jobs. Okay, okay. Uh, what what uh, is the hardest part about farming? Like, if for somebody like me who's never farmed, what would you say? Well, it's a full-time job, and... Yeah, keeping machinery up is, and right now the type farming I do now is so much different than we we did. Of course, we just had old tractors and and all. And the fact of the matter is, when I started working, I started working with a team of horses, and I did my first work on the, behind a team of horses. And we had those we got bale hay, and my dad had a lot of ground he was he was farmed a lot of farm out there so you went from a you went from horses to a tractor yeah what like do you remember when that happened like did you think this was the most amazing thing ever when you well we, I still have the old tractor out that, that he got in 1946 it doesn't work <laughs> it's, it's still sitting out, out there and so that was after the second world war he got a tractor during the Second World War, he had an old farm all, and they didn't have rubber tires. You couldn't get rubber tires during the war, and so he put steel lugs on that, on the tractor, and uh, he had no tractor, and we had horses and tractor both. Okay. We, we, worked, we both worked both horses and tractor, and we started bailing hay with what they call an old stationary press. We... Right, brought the hay up to the baler and threw the baler, threw the hay in there by hand. And I was just a little kid. We had poke wires back through the hay baler, and that's where I started. Bailing hay. Yeah. Now, do y'all still bail, do you do your grandson still bail hay? Well, a little bit. It's quite different now with the round balers and all this. We had no little old square balers, and then you had to haul the hay into the barn and. Now then, they do most of the stuff with the tractors and stuff. The, the farm, farming's quite an operation now. Yeah. You see these two hundred thousand dollar tractors out there now <laughs> running around. We may have paid three or four thousand for tractors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have the AC units and all the things now. They're just like Cadillacs, aren't they? Uh, out there and uh, yeah, so. Um, Tell me how you ended up, because I first n know of you through RAs. Uh, Noble Avenue, you coming to pick up my uncles, and they jumping in the back of the truck, and you taking a load of kids over there, and then we, I would go every once in a while. I was still relatively young. Well, uh, Anthony and my son, Paul, were real close friends, and Buell Haynes, and the three of them ran around together all the time. And fact of the matter is, one Sunday, one summer, they were going to be having a hay bailing crew, and they called themselves the Orioles. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they were there one summer, the Orioles. <laughs> so they did one summer. The, my own machinery was so old, it was pretty hard for them to keep the, keep it going, so they didn't last very long. <laughs> and so... Anthony and then Tim came along. Tim was the same age as my other son, Dan, and uh -huh. so they called my family real close families. Yeah. And there are incidents you may not know about, uh, what, there's 13 children yes. in your family, wasn't there? Yeah, there's 13 of my uh, aunts and uncles. Okay. And uh, one day, the uh, vice principal there at the junior high, every morning he would call and when the kids were absent to see why they weren't in school. And he called over there at the Coleman's house and says, 
And it's Tim sick today. And his mother, or his mother says, uh, well, Tim's supposed to be at school. <laughs> and a little while later, she called back and says, he was up there and was asleep in bed. And he'll be there just a minute. And so that was... <laughs> and then I became friends with Mr. Coleman. And yeah. He was preaching here in Guthrie. And, and, but he and my son were real close friends, and they spent a lot of time out, of, out to farm, out to our place. And my son spent a lot of time over their place. And... Just, just they were real good friends. Yeah, they yeah. played football together and track together, and they were real good. Yeah. Now, how many children do you have? I have four children. Four. We have two girls that were born here in Guthrie, and then uh, when we went overseas, they were five and and nine years old, and we spent overseas. And I had two sons born in Kenya, Africa. Oh, so Danny and Paul were born in Kenya. I was born in Kenya. Wow. And yeah. did they get to spend much time over there? Because you said you well, spent seven were, years. They were, they were both born there. We were there three years. We came back to the States for a year, and then we went back for three more years. Oh, okay. And so they, Paul started first grade there in Kenya, and Dan was too young. He didn't start school there. Okay. And they don't remember much about the country. They, they don't remember it. They got, we've gone back one time since they... You know, grew, were married and have gone back. So they were, they don't remember Kenya. Yeah, yeah. Just, just us talking about it. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool, though, that they can say they were born in Kenya. Yeah, they were yeah. both born in Kenya. And at that particular time, they had dual citizenship. If you're born there, you could be a citizen, and you had dual citizenship. They were citizens of the United States for sale. They were citizens of Kenya. But when you got 18, you had to choose. Oh. You to choose your citizenship. Okay. And so they no longer are Kenya citizens. So they work for a while. That is for, that's pretty cool. Uh, how did you become a missionary? And what was that like to become a missionary for you? Well, we just, I was teaching in Guthrie here and decided that we just felt like the Lord would lead us to do something else. And so... We got to investigate it, and Southern Baptist had missionary teachers around the world, and so we didn't know where we were going to go. We just volunteered to be teachers, and I was a teacher. She was a nurse, and so uh, one thing led another, and we met some people from Kenya, and they had home on furlough, and they went back to Kenya, and we, so we decided that Kenya's where we wanted to go, and uh, that's where they sent us. They needed a teacher at the school there in Kenya. So I taught school. I taught math and physics there at the high school in, in Mombasa, Kenya. Was the uh, was the way that you approached education that much different there versus here? Well, yes. It, to start out with, their their system. They used the British system on school, and everything was kind of geared toward a test at the end of school. And when we had students come in, they would just, they had finished grade school and they had to take a test before they could get into junior, to high school. And we had to accept them. And then after high school, they took another test to determine whether they could go to college or not or what they call the kind of job. And so all, all the teaching there was to get prepared for these tests. Whereas, you know, in the States, we were teaching more to think and try to reason but the, there was everything was geared toward trying to pass this test and, and kind of what we've gone to here in the states yeah it's a lot like that uh, and so i never did particularly like the idea just teach it toward a test so i always wanted to teach to think and the reason but then it, that was the difference yeah in the test huh, i didn't um i guess i never recognized uh, the approach to education. So you're saying like when you were in school, they were teaching you to teach kids to think and to reason. Reason, yeah, a little more than than uh, said the grade wasn't that important as far as a test is concerned. You just yeah. threw it along. And you were asking about the royal ambassadors. Yeah. Uh, see, Anthony and and Paul were real good friends, and so they started going. And so Tim started going, and then. 
all the neighborhood started going, so I had this pickup that you remember started out in the pickup, and I put star tracks on. Uh -huh. And then finally, we got a bus over to, over to the church, and I started riding by them. So on Wednesday night, I had about 25 or 30 kids. Oh, yeah. From Guth to come to our church and go. And the RA program, we had a couple of real good directors, Larry Hay, and, uh, and he, he, he was one of our teachers. And they kids, the laws boys were at school, they, they really came to our church. In fact, the matter is, uh, the principal here at junior high was one of those boys. Yeah, Todd. Todd yeah. Bramwell. He, uh -huh. was, he was our neighbor out east of town and also... He had went to the uh, same college Paul went to, Wayland Baptist University down in Prairie Texas. Okay. And yeah. So, and we helped help him get started, get his scholarship down to Plainview. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was good to see when Ty came back to uh, be the principal at the junior high. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's always fun to see someone come back home and, and invest, especially in our in our next generation. Now, did you always just like end up just gravitating to youth? Because weren't you on the Logan County uh, Youth Board or? Yeah, Logan County Youth and Family Services. It's yeah, Youth and Family Services. Logan Community Center now. I was, well, I belonged to the board for about 20 years and I was president about 10 years of the board. And then when I graduated, when I, uh, Resigned out last and I was on the Scuther School Board one year, one term, four years, mm -hmm. and then so uh, came back and went to teaching back here. Gotcha. Um, t talking about the youth, when you were you were once youthful as well, right? And so, did you uh, the Highland Pool? Do you remember? Yeah, I was. I went there the first night they opened that pool up in Guthrie. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that was over right there. It's kind of interesting. Uh, when they opened the, stuff, the swimming pool, they didn't have baskets for clothes. Okay. And everybody just put the clothes on the floor. Oh. And and we went and that night they they had five diving boards. Did you know they had five? No. Boards out that swimming pool. No. They had five of them on the end of the swimming pool. So were they all lined up? They were lined up. Okay, I just know there two. Was two two small ones on the outside, and then two middle ones, and the one the high high diving board in the middle. That sounds like it's dangerous for everybody to be jumping. Everybody had to you had to go out straight. Okay. Or you ended up hitting somebody and. They had, they had the five swimming pools, I, I mean, five diving boards, I guess. Finally, one of them broke or something, so they took out two of them. And then finally, they took out all but one. Yeah. But uh, when we were swimming out there, you'd go in, you'd put your clothes down, you hope when you got out of swimming pool, you'd find your clothes. They were on the floor somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and the dressing room, I don't know whether you've ever been in that dressing room out there or not. It, yeah, the high twice, twice as big as this room and that. And somewhere, <laughs> there were clothes somewhere in there. And the if somebody room, didn't, there's nobody didn't pick them up and take them out, right? Yeah, nobody bothered anybody else's clothes. And yeah. The night they opened the swimming pool, they had some guys come in and girls and they did all kinds of tricks and what have you as they initiated in the pool. So... That's cool. What year was that? Well, it, it, I can't remember. It was either 46 or 47, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah, was, uh, I think it's the same. Is that the same pool? Or? Same pool, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And they built that pool. And they built a pool over favor about the same year. Did they yeah. remember that pool yeah. over there? Uh -huh. same favor? I, well, I've heard stories about it, and I guess it, it existed when I was younger, but... I never went to it, but yeah. people talk about it all the time. Yeah, see, that was back during segregation. Yeah. They built a white swimming pool, so they had to build a black swimming pool. So okay. That was the reason. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, um, but I don't know when they took that one out. I, can't, I don't remember. I don't know. Well, I imagine it's about the same time they inter integrated a high school. The high school was built in 66, 67 was the first class graduated out of this high school now mm -hmm. and 
you know, up until then, we had the separate schools. We had labor school and we had the other high school. Yeah. And they, that's when they integrated the two schools and, and brought the two together. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think my, my mom has mentioned that she's been on the podcast and she 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 kind of told those stories because I want to say it was either her freshman year or or something because she went to eighth she went to the junior high first before she got to the high school I guess okay it was at the junior high they uh, the principal there at Mr. Tipton they when they did away with high school the black high school they, he became vice principal at the junior high oh okay the first year they had this, the school there and so 67 was their first, or 66, I think it was their first 66, okay. class. And uh, I remember I started teaching in 62, and uh, at that particular time, they didn't have a physics class in their, in favor school. So two students came over to my class, I taught physics, and they came over to Guthrie just for the one class. Oh, okay. They, one of them was Shields, Hebert, and Edmund Bro. They both are pro- fathers were professors out of Langston. Oh, okay. And they both came into my physics class. And this was in '62. This was before integration. That was before integration. Yeah. Oh, wow. They still had they still had the Faber School. Yeah. And they went to Faber all, all their classes except physics. the one that I are. They came over for physics class. Oh, okay, and then they would just go and back. They, and then they started. Then they 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 integrated. The football team or the basketball, especially back when oh, uh, Fred Moser, Mulder, you remember him? Was that before uh, the actual integration of the school? They integrated basketball before that? Yeah, before they integrated the school. They, okay. came, they came over and played basketball. Those that were real good came over to the white school and played basketball. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think, like, I've heard bits and pieces of that, like, from my mom and stuff, but I didn't. I didn't realize that it was before they integrated the schools. Yeah, yeah, before they integrated the schools. And uh, actually the gym there at the high school, or the junior high, now was built in 1953. In other words, before, when I was in high school, we had our basketball games out at the armory. Uh, the armory on college? Not college. Yeah. What street is that? Walnut? This college, I all other college. Football. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And we had basketball, played played games out there all the time. Oh, okay. Because there was no gym yet. Didn't, didn't have a gym in Guthrie High School. Now, did it? At what time was Fogarty the high school? Fogarty never was a high school. I don't think. Was there? there was there was a Logan County High School? Okay. That they, that that's before way before I remember them. And favor of that was junior high. Ever since I can remember. Yeah, I just remember seeing a picture, and I think it did say Logan County High Logan School. Logan County High School. Yeah, yeah. and so bad. I wasn't sure what when that when that was. I don't remember that. It was back in I think the junior high was built in 1918. It's when the building was for, uh-huh. and that's when they did away. I guess stuck with Logan County High School. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. Now, whenever you were in school, like when you were younger. Did, did y'all cruise? Like, what did y'all do for fun in Guthrie? I drove up and down Main Street. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was in high school, I had Teen Town. Teen which, Town? Which was lower than in the basement of the Carnegie Library. And okay. You know, on Friday and Saturday night, they opened Teen Town. And from about 7 to 10, anybody that wanted to go all in, teen, teenagers went up to Teen Town. And they had a sponsor lived there. And we, you know, I don't really, have you ever been in a Carnegie Library? I have. They have it's a man in Oklahoma, right? Yeah. Yeah. They have downstairs, and they said that was Tom Mix's uh, gym when he was lived in Guthrie. Oh, really? I didn't know that. They claim that, that he used that for his gym, and they used it for part of the Teen Town. Mm, okay. Teen Town, what did they have in it? What was in Teen Town? Like games? Well, Teen Town had the game t- tables, play games, card games, and then they had a little of that dance floor and they had ping pong tables and had a ca- bar or canteen there. Okay. That you could buy cokes and stuff. And, and it, was, it was 
quite popular. But that was the spot. And then, other than that, you were cruising the strip? It was cruising. Like, what was the strip for you all at that time? It was from the, where the, where the temple is now down to where the police station is. City oh. Hall, turn around. You turn around there and you went back and forth up and down the main street. What was right there? Because City Hall wasn't there, was it? No, that, they had an old City Hall. They oh, yeah, that's right. That was right there. Yeah, it was the uh -huh. same, same location. Yeah. And the old city hall was right there, and they had the police station downstairs in the city hall. Okay, okay, not much. Say. That is so funny because I, you know, as I'm sitting down with people, I always ask them, So, what did y'all do, especially when they're older? And the strip is still the same, you know, it's like, so it, it's amazing that they no longer do the strip, you know, because it's been, people have been doing it for years. Years, yeah, yeah, it was quite popular. And, let me tell you a little story that uh, when we were in Kenya, one night we, uh, our lady invited us to supper and we went over supper and there was a, a black couple over there from uh, Los Angeles. Okay. And they came in and they, we sat down and ate supper and they says, where are you from? And he says, are you, he's from, I said, we're from Guthrie. And he says, where do you know uh, uh, Harold Bowen? And at that particular time, there were two Harold Bullens in Guthrie. I knew both of them, and his, he was a shoe shineman. Uh, he shined shoes right across from the city hall. He says, he's my cousin. <laughs> and here we were in Kenya, and he was from Los Angeles, and I was from Guthrie, and we were sitting there at the same supper table. That is amazing. Yeah, especially back then, like, travel is a little bit more frequent now, but... Back then, oh, oh, Highway 66, <laughs> and he was telling me that you know it was back during segregation. And he said when they traveled, they had to plan to be sure to arrive somewhere where they could stay all night in a hotel oh. because they couldn't stay in motels like yeah. that. Yeah, then, yeah. So. Oh man, I can't even. I can't yeah. even imagine that. You can't imagine that. No, I can't even imagine it. You but know, it was that way. And, yeah, and. The segregation. My kids can't understand it either, but we came, we lived through it. Yeah, yeah, you did. I hate to go back to it. Yeah, sure. no, I'm so, I'm so grateful that I, you know, for the people who did the, the things that they did, so we don't have to do that. Yeah. Or being that in living that that space anymore. So. so yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I was going to ask you, does Guthrie have underground tunnels? Do you know for sure? Where, you know, underneath the stadium, we used to always play, when we played football, both the teams stayed under the stadium. Dress, they had dressing rooms under the stadium. You know, they're at the north end, that yep. got closed off now. Uh -huh. We always dressed underneath there, and they had dressing rooms underneath there, and both teams came out from underneath the stadium. And that was the furthest the temple. They said that temple, the, the they said that the caves went further back in there, but we never down there didn't see okay. them. Okay, okay. see them. But they went, we went there, because we, we had a dressing room under that, under Harrison Street. And it started leaking so bad, and, you know, they got, so they had to repair it and all that. So they moved the stadium, and they moved the dressing room. Oh, to the back. back yeah. To the back south there. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's always some people always talking about some underground tunnels and stuff. I was just like, let me ask somebody who's been around a little bit longer than. Well, man, see I, that. I heard of them, but I've never seen them. And yeah. The word it was them other than underneath that street there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, they used to have rodeos there at their stadium. Oh, no, I didn't know that. 89ers Day, they would turn up the field and they put the, state, the pins in there and uh, they would fix. Fans and they had rodeos there and every year. Oh wow! And they had about four or five days that have rodeos there. Okay. And eighty nine day, and that stadium would be full. There, every seat would be full. I bet it would. The rodeo. <laughs> and then they finally moved to kind of moved the rodeo away from there. Now, during that same time, did they still do the eighty nine er baseball games too? Or when did that come about? Was well, that, that was later on. Okay. Later they started this. Okay. It's a baseball game. Because was the baseball field there? Yeah. The baseball okay. field was there. And they had to take down the goalposts there at the south end so they could extend the gotcha. baseball field. Gotcha. 
but they always put up their pens down there and they put cattle in. They just had a regular rodeo there. They always plow the field up every year. Yeah. And oh. And the fact of the matter is, before they built buildings down the fairgrounds, they had the one year they had the livestock show down there at the fairgrounds at the stadium. Oh, okay. they put that big old tent. Oh, yeah. Big old tent down there, and they had the stock show down there. Whenever, because you were a judge, right? Were you a judge yeah, for livestock? I, I judged on the where we had judging teams in high school and judged on livestock team, and they had what they called the dairy products team. And we won the state and got to go to a national contest. We went to a national contest. Livestock went to Kansas City and uh, their products went to Waterloo, Iowa to the national competition. What, uh, when, you, when you're doing those judges, like, what are you looking for? Well, uh, the way they set up the contests, they're quite different now, but they used to, they'd set up a class of, say, four steers. And you'd have to play some first, second, third, and fourth. And then they would have two classes of cattle. They'd have two classes of hogs and two classes of sheep. And you'd have to set each one of them. And if you had if you hadn't placed correct, you got 50 points. If you missed them, you got less points. Mm -hmm. And they took off points. If you had one out of place, you, then they sort of... And, then they take all. They had teams. Each school had a team, and they take, and they had five, three people on a team, and they take the three scores and add them together, and then they would determine the high score. Then was the winners of that contest. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. And so that's the way they did the livestock judging, and every every thing had their own rules on the way to it. And every products we. Tested milk and and things and had to do with those and, and our FFA team. <clears throat> when I was a freshman, we won uh, what they call the Farmer Stockman Award because we had, took all our teams over to Stillwater and we had the contest one day and we'd have a team here and a team there and a team somewhere else and they'd take all the teams' scores and they each. each uh, I had a different uh, team, and so they would add all the scores together, to, and the team that had the high score would be the winner. And I, we won that thing for four years in a row. Oh, wow. And that's the first time Guthrie won it, and so they didn't have very, we didn't have a big FFA like they have now. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, how many grandkids do you have? Well, I have... Four, uh, I have six, uh, 16 grandkids, and I have 31 great-grandkids. Oh, my. <laughs> and uh, let me brag just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, one of my uh, great-grandsons was on Dale's basketball team last year. That uh, They won state championship four years in a row, or three years in a row, and he was on their team all three years. Oh, wow. Champion. So he 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 said he got all the rings, huh? Well, yeah, he's a he's a senior this year, and so we'll see whether he gets okay get win or not. So he can he can do it four times. Yeah. Oh wow! He'll be four times, and you know, Paul, my oldest son, he he was a runner, and he was one that ran for Guthrie. He and Clay Tarter started the cross country team there and Guthrie, he was on the first team and he won the state championship in the cross country. Oh, wow. And when he was a freshman, he was uh, in the, I think, top 10 in cross country. He, he made all state when he was a freshman and made it every year from then on. Oh, wow. Years, yeah. Paul did? Yeah. Well, I didn't know that, uh, I would have thought that we had cross country before then. That, so we got cross country kind of late. Yeah, yeah, it was. There wasn't very much to cross country at that time, and he and Clay Tarter, and there was two or three other boys joined, and they got, I think their second year, they had a team, they won state. Wow. And they won say, two or three times since then. Well, right. like, several times since yeah, then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and Paul is where? 
Where is Paul at? He's not in the He's state. Costa Rica now. Costa Rica. He's in Costa Rica. He pastors the International Baptist Church of Costa Rica. He's been doing that for a while now. Yeah, he's been there 21 years. My goodness. And same church, and it's a, it's a, in the Spanish community, but he does he does his preaching in English. It's English speaking, English speaking school. Okay. And so. So does he have a school with us? Just the church. It's a, well, he's just a church. Okay, okay. Just a church. Yeah, yeah. Um, how um, how many kids does... Do you have any other kids over there? Is it just him and his family? Just he, he and his his wife's over there. They're, they have one child, and she's back in the States. Okay. She lives in uh, uh, Santa and uh, down by Austin, Texas. Okay. And New Brunsville, Texas. Okay. But... Uh, and that's the only ones there. Now, my other uh, grandchildren, I've got some great grandchildren, or grandchildren that are in the service. One of them is in, uh, in uh, Honduras right now. He's, he's the one who went to West Point. Okay. So, there's quite a bunch of reasons. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter lives down by Shawnee, and her, her, all her kids go to Shawnee to school down there, the day old school and okay. North uh, North Rock Creek School. Now, uh, she's, is she the oldest? Or is LeMoyne the oldest? She's LeMoyne's the oldest and oh. she's the second. Okay, okay. There's two years difference between those two, two and a half. Gotcha, 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 so. gotcha. Um, what, watching Guthrie grow, like from the time, what is some of the main things that you've noticed over the years about the growth of Guthrie? Well, you know, uh, one of your questions was what about Guthrie, choosing Guthrie. Uh, my father was one of the first ones that had plumbing in his house out in the country. And his plumbing was put in by Mr. Hurley, who was Ted Hurley's grandfather. Okay. And so, uh, Ted, and then Ted's father, Jack Hurley, put in my plumbing when I built a house. <laughs> and then Ted took care of my house till he retired. And so one thing about living in Guthrie, you know everybody. Yeah. And you've known them for all these years. And it's just uh, you know, you're welcome your call. You need somebody you need service folks and that's a good nice thing about you don't have a bunch of strangers come in, you got somebody that you know who you've gone to school with and Guthrie's been real good that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so true. So true. Tell me, you were married 66 years. 66, that is correct. Uh, what's the key to being married 66 years? Well, you know, I was thinking that question, and the answer, I think, my wife and I were both independent of each other, and it depended on each other. Yeah. We each one did our own thing, and we enjoyed it. She was a nurse, and I was in education, and so we always agreed on doing something we one didn't do something around the other one back and there was always doing them together yeah and I think that's the secret and raising kids it's important that the parents decide on everybody help everybody else if I say something she back me up she says something I back her up so we never had any discussion as to what we should do or not do yeah, yeah, that's good. And she was able to lead her life, and I led my life, and we led our life together. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that a bunch. Um, thinking about today, 2024, do you do technology? Do what? Do you do technology, cell phones? Or? No, I, I don't. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I, I, I still live in the 20th century. <laughs> I, never, I never came out of the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> when, I was, when I was retired from Langston out there, they were just starting to use the computers to all the classroom work and stuff. And uh -huh. I said, I don't want to work learning all this over, so I just left, left yeah. the field. Do you carry a cell phone? Just a cell phone, but all it's, I do is write, make telephone calls and listen to them. Is, is it a flip phone? or It's a flip phone. Okay. It's a flip phone. I don't text or I don't... Take text, I just... So, have you ever used the internet? No, not really. 
Wow. That's pretty impressive. Um, so, uh, I need to trade you lives then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, if I was going to stay around, the kids are all pretty good. And, uh, yeah. Turn enough time to do the internet work. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lemoyne was your yeah, she was your agent doing this transaction. She's she was the one I was emailing back and forth with and uh, texting and getting you all squared away, which is great. Yeah, she does that, and, and with my wife died and Betty died, she we redid the house and made a duplex out of it. She lives one end, I live in the other. Her and her husband live okay. one end, I live in the other, and we still live out on the farm. And okay, enjoy the. Country living. Yeah. How, now, how far out is the farm? About three miles. Okay. Three miles. Yeah, out at 105? It's about, it's right off of 33. It's on oh, 33. dirt road, on Cooksey Road out there. Okay, okay. On dirt road. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I say dirt road, gravel road. It's it's a good road. It's a good road. <laughs> you don't have to fight much anyway. It is, yeah, that, that's good. Um, let me see. I got. I met, got a couple more questions. Okay. Um, why? I think I asked you this already, but why? Like math. Like which part of math was your favorite? I'm just curious. Well, about. I was more of algebra. I liked the algebra part of it rather than the geometry. In other words, I like to work with the figures and the unknowns and so so that part of it. And when I went to college, I was going. I just, when I decided I wasn't going to go into uh, boy, I was going to go ahead and become a teacher. I had the choice. I was either going to go into history or math. And the math, my math instructor down at Central State said, uh, said the coaches usually take the history positions <laughs> and says, uh, you math, you'll have a lot better chance of getting a job. So uh, I liked math, and so I decided to major oh. math instead of history. That makes sense. Yeah, that's, that, that was the reason, and, and I always enjoyed math. Yeah. And for people who are wanting to be in education, do you have any tips for them? Like, what what is it that allows for you to be in education uh, for a long period of time to have a successful career? Well, you've got to have the best interests of the students in mind. I think the teacher, uh, uh, the teachers that have really been successful, really have had the students in mind. And it wasn't a job, it was trying to protect the, this information. And all the teachers I had, or, or say all of them, uh, most of them, they always followed that particular philosophy. And the student is the number one reason you're there, mm -hmm. and you keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. And, well, that's... Go ahead. And, and, you know, when, and the same thing was true over at Kenya. Kenya is an interesting country too. It's I don't know whether you're familiar with its history or not, but it's it used to be a British colony, and it got its independence in 1963, and we went over there in '66. So it was a brand new country, with everything, with all the transition from a colony to a country. Okay. So we got to experience that to help the students in making transition from a one type of government to another type of government. Oh, wow. And so the students, we worked with that a lot. In yeah. That category too. Um, was that, was that, uh, like, did that impact y'all in a major way being over there from, not being, being from the States? Not really. Not really. Um, Kenya was kind of a unique African country because the British had been there and yeah. the education was in it in English anyway. Yeah. And so we just continued in mainly English. We were able to uh, teach in English and do all our work in English instead of trying to learn Swahili. Oh, yeah. Swahili was that language. Yeah. And they had a lot of tribal languages besides Swahili. So we didn't try to learn all the other languages. We tried to get, learn enough Swahili just to get by. <laughs> <laughs> and then did our teaching in English. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a morning routine kind of guy, or like to think that I am. I try to do some of the same things every morning. Are you a morning routine guy? Do you have things that you do every every day or every morning to start your day? Well, not uh, not. I'm not early morning. I'm okay. I'm pretty steady morning. <laughs> and I get up every morning about the same time and set. 
have a schedule, always has, uh, and I always got school early and always has, uh, I've always, I said I ran my life on bells. We have bells, you know, the class bells to get out of class. So anyway, anyway, bells kind of run my, or run my class. That's good, that's good, that's good. Well, the last question is, what does community win mean to you? What? What does community win? When you hear community wins, what does that mean to you? Well, I mean, success. There's no succeed. You don't succeed by success. Success is, the best part of succeeding is success. Yeah. And, I, and it's always real th- thrilling to see the kids succeed. Um, and this is what I have, you know, a number of the Guthrie teachers were my students at one time. And I'm always proud to say, well, see we're my student, and she was my student, and he was my yeah. student, <laughs> and see them make a, you know, real good citizen, whatever, yeah. whatever they choose, choose to do. And I feel like, well, at least at least I touched their lives. I didn't yeah. ruin them anyway. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, to see, to be a teacher, and I think that's one of the... Uh, you know, one of the special things about being a teacher is whenever you can see your students later in life that you played a part in, you know, helping them think and reason and uh, move forward in life is really cool. Well, it is. And, and every time one of them, them succeed, you feel like you succeed a little bit. Right. <laughs> it's kind of like children. When you see your children go off and be uh, productive citizens, people giving back. Uh, it's like yes, yes, uh-huh. yeah. That's a, that's a win for us. So, Mr. Dreesen, I sure do appreciate this. Thank you so much for being willing to sit down with me. Well, I was glad to do it, and feel honored to be asked to do it. And and it's been a great life, and Guthrie's been a great place. Been awful good to me. I'm thankful to Guthrie. And, yeah. And. You know, you, you see a lot of suburbs, but the town itself hasn't grown much. But right downtown is quite different than it was when we were all up. <laughs> but it's still downtown. It's still downtown. Yeah, the buildings probably looked a lot different for you. Well, a lot of a lot of businesses, the businesses are all different. Yeah, but the buildings yeah. are same same buildings, but different 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 types of businesses. All businesses. No old Tasco. No. Uh, TG and Y. Yeah, we have Anthony and Penny's and, and uh, three big clothing stores downtown. Uh huh. Crest, a little trunk department store. And, you mean all those things, all the hardware stores, and no, don't exist anymore. No. Walmart came along and took a home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what I remember is like Walmart coming and some of those things just gradually kind of leaving. And so, but it was so cool to be able to come to downtown to be able to shop. Yeah. Uh, at so many different places that were just everyday stuff that you needed. Yeah, you never did. And to go to the city was quite a quite a trip. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, old 77, that's all we had going down to. Sugar Road. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, was, that was before the interstate came in. And it was just quite a trip to go to the city. Yeah, do you know Gene Owen? Yes. So Gene was just, I just sat down with Gene last week, and uh, he was talking about how, you know, even with the interstate at one point, it was only 55 miles per hour, so it was a big deal to get to the city. Like, you weren't just jumping back and forth to the city to get through like we do now. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it was... It wasn't that long ago that we weren't getting up and back, back and forth to the city like we are today. Well, you know, now, back during the war, the speed limit was 35 miles an hour. That oh, was my. Highway. Oh, my. 35 miles per hour to get to the city? Yeah. <laughs> so, at any rate, it's quite a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a big difference. It's a big difference. So, well, all right. Thank you, Mr. Dreesen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Uh, Thank you all for hitting that play button for another episode of the Guthrie America Podcast. And uh, we are on a mission to have every story told of the people who do life here and who are from here. The question is, will yours be next? Go with it.